Hi, and welcome to our third day of our FND virtual conference. We're really excited to have everyone here with us today. And we are have kind of some new things today that we're going to be discussing. And we just want to go over a few housekeeping things to get started. First, any questions will need to be in the Q&A. And if you do not want your name to be shared with anyone, then please do click the anonymous button and and so that's not shared with others that are attending. Uh, also, we would like to remind everyone that uh, we do have a couple doctors with us today that they can answer questions about personal health. They don't know your history and we encourage everyone to discuss anything that they do here in any of our uh, webinars to please discuss that with your personal health care provider. And so uh, just so you know, those are some of the questions that we won't be able to answer today. A couple uh, other things that we want to just say, uh, we want to give thanks to a lot of the others that are here with us as well. Uh, we'll start off with uh, Dr. Afra Mowenter, and then we will have a youth panel, and then we will hear from Dr. Alex Lin. And so we'll get started first with uh, Dr. Mowenter. Thank you for being here with us today. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Oh, and we have don't have your sound, so <laughs> let's try that again. <laughs> my name is Go Afra, ahead. My name is Afra Munter, and I have a private practice in Boulder, Colorado, and my specialty area is FND. And um, today I will be talking about the way I work with young adults and youth, which is really one of my greatest passions. I love working with that population. And um, I would say I'm, I wouldn't be the practitioner I am if I hadn't had so many people in my practice who have been patiently walking this path with me and who really um, taught me so much about FND. So I want to thank everybody um, I've been working with over the years. Well, thank you for that. Uh, I found when we met that you did have a little bit of a different approach to FND. And so we really are trying to bring some of those new ideas and concepts and just explore some of the different treatment options. Of course, mm -hmm. it's still FND. There's still a lot of similarities, but there are a few different nuances. And so that's what we're just hoping to hear from you today a little bit and how you um, view FND and how your treatment program and things work. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll let you get started, How, wherever you want to go, which direction. Okay, so what I would like, I um, put together um, a PowerPoint, so to just give you a little visuals and to learn a bit, little bit more about how I think about FND and um, how my treatment is structured. So maybe that would be a go good way to go about that right now to just show the PowerPoint. And if you have questions, please remember, you can just write them down in the Q&A and afterwards we can talk about it. And you can write down some notes, maybe on a piece of paper, if that's easier for you. Um, but I would love to have a dialogue because I think really FND is a dialogue within the body. So I would love to have a dialogue with you and I would love to learn from you and we can share um, what's most important. Great. So I will start here. Okay. So the topic of today's um, dialogue I would like to have with you is the body, mind, and emotion. I squeezed that in there last minute. Connection in the treatment of young adults and youth with FND. And um, so I would love to share a few of the working hypotheses that I work with in my practice. And I think most of you have uh, been struggling with the number one in particular. So I look at FND as something that is a normal reaction to an overwhelming experience or experiences that exceeds the person's ability to cope or integrate what had happened. 
And such experiences can be long-term experiences of chronic stress or a single traumatic event that overloads the person's nervous system. So what I'm saying is really that your symptoms that tell us something and it's a normal reaction to what you have experienced. So long-term experiences could be, and maybe some of you can relate to that, um, maybe multiple surgeries over multiple years. Long-term experiences could be sensory sensitivities so that you have a constant sensory overload that overloads your nervous system. And then the single traumatic event can be just what that is, right? I mean, whatever you have had experienced in your life. So I, that's how I look at FND, um, that it is really a normal reaction to what has happened in your life and that you have not had the ability to actually integrate what has happened. I look at FND also as a trilogy. So it's body, mind, and emotion. So when somebody comes into my practice, I do not just look at the symptoms, the physical symptoms. You know, FND in the body could be NES or out of body experiences or functional weakness. Um, and, you know, you are all very familiar with that. And I also integrate the mind. So FND in the mind could be raising thoughts memory problems, difficulty focusing, and emotionally, FND, in my opinion, I'm just talking about my own beliefs today, um, can show up as anxiety, depression, fear, anger. And um, so all of this, I looked at together when somebody comes into my practice. Then the, the second, um, the third hypothesis, is that FND is highly personal and it's never the same. So if two people come into my office with the exact same symptoms, the treatment protocol is not the same because everybody is different. So if I have two people come in who are in a wheelchair and who have twitches or who have seizures or drop attacks, um, even if the symptoms are the same, the treatment is not the same because the person is different. It's highly personal. It's highly, um, highly based on who you are and how your symptoms play out in your life. I believe that um, what I call unhelpful body, mind, emotion pathways, so that you know is my name for FND, are created because at the time you might not have had resources. So resources are lacking and the natural homeostasis of our whole system, of the brain, of the body, of the nervous system is actually disrupted. And uh, further I look at FND as a, a complex expression of a dysregulated nervous system. So what that means is that many of you might have had the experience of a hyper, too much activation in your system. So there could be you know, anxiety or twitches. So the nervous system is hyper activated. It's too much activation. So that's an expression of a dysregulated nervous system or your nervous system might be not enough activated. So that's hypo activation. And that could show up in paralysis or numbness um, or limb weakness. So it, there are different expressions of a dysregulated nervous system, but the main uh, part of the work I do is actually to identify that and to help you learn the tools to regulate your nervous system. And number six is something that most practitioners by now know. So you don't have to have a history of trauma to develop FND. And I put it on there because I think there's still some myth around that. And um, I think it's important to really educate um, everybody out there in the world about FND. So when I um, work with young adults and youth, 
which I really love doing. It's one of my favorite populations. Um, what I've seen over the years is that there's a high prevalence of sensory sensitivity. So what that means is you might have a difficult time screening out sensory information from the outside and that floods your system. And then it's like big chaos in your whole system. And so that is a big piece of what I've seen, actually even more so in the younger population I work with. And also a sense of being different. So many of the young clients who come into my office, they say, I feel different, I don't fit in, I don't feel understood, I feel like somebody dropped me off on the wrong planet. And that's a big part of FND as well. So it's not just the physical symptoms, but to really take in the person and their experience so that we can work together. I talked about number eight a little bit earlier. So I said there is hyper, too much activation, and then there's hypo, not enough activation of the nervous system. And some of you might have experiences where your symptoms are mostly in the hyperactivation. Some of you might have experiences where your symptoms are mostly in the hypoactivation. And some of you actually fluctuate really rapidly. So you might have a seizure while you have paralysis. And that's really, really hard to be with. I mean, all of these symptoms are hard to be with, but I think in my experience, what I've seen is that rapid cycling is really hard to be with. And the number nine is something that is more like a foundational um, aspect of the work I do. I talk about two things. And I will explain those a little bit more um, with the next few slides. One is the window of tolerance and the other one is the activation curve. And I use those two concepts to assess. So when you come into my office, I have those concepts in my mind to assess and I use them to work with you. And I use them to reevaluate where you are with your symptoms. So those two concepts, you know, I, I will share more about and anybody who has worked with me there is the, this, the person is familiar with it. And when we look at number 10, again, it's really FND can happen when being pushed outside that window of tolerance. And I will put up a slide right now so you can get a sense of that a little bit. So this is a very basic um, slide of what we call the window of tolerance and you can see that here and the window of tolerance was initially um, introduced by Dan Siegel about 20 years ago and it's being used in the trauma research and in the clinical work um, where clinicians really use this to study and to be aware of what's happening in the nervous system so the window of tolerance in here is a place where you feel, you feel safe, you feel calm, your nervous system feels calm, where you might have no or just a little, a uh, few questions, uh, a few symptoms. Um, and then when you look up here, this is um, two different places where there is um, more hyper and too much activation. And when you look down here, there is not enough activation. And I want to show you in the next slide how that might show up in your FND symptoms, because what I've done over the years is really looked at how does FND, how do the symptoms show up in this concept within the window of tolerance. So there's a lot of information in here. So you don't have to actually read all of that. I just wanted to give you some information um, in regards to where your symptoms might be. So you can see um, hyperactivation can show up as emotional overwhelm or non-epileptic seizures or hyperventilation, dissociation. 
Um, and on the other end here, it can be a combination of paralysis or seizures. So the freeze response is something that you might have heard of as the deer in the headlight. So the deer in the headlight stands there is highly activated on the inside and on the outside, there's a freeze. And I think there are some symptoms in FND where we can see that I have experienced that in my life too. So it's actually a normal nervous system reaction to what has happened in our lives. So um, maybe you can look at this and say, oh, what are my symptoms and where do they fit in? So is it more overactivation or is it more underactivation down here? So this is where I just um, wrote down a little bit of what I just talked about. And um, you can access the slides later. That's why I put them in here. Did I talk about the NES again as being a sign of overactivation and more like a drop attack would be more a sign of an underactivation. And if you wanna take a moment right now and actually check in with yourself. So I'm doing it right now while I'm sitting here. I think it's such a great practice to just get a sense of where your body is and where you are emotionally right now and where your thinking is. So that you can get a sense of, oh, am I actually pretty well regulated, which would mean you're in the window of tolerance here, right? When you don't have a lot of symptoms or do I experience any of the symptoms up here? Twitches, over breathing, maybe you feel a little anxious or down here is the not enough activation. So that would be more um, difficulty walking maybe or fatigue and you can check in with yourself right now and see oh this is where my nervous system is you know and it shows up in my body and it shows up in my thinking and it shows up in my emotions a big part of what I work with is um, you know what I call the activation curve so the idea is that I don't just look at the main symptoms when you come into my office, but I actually look at the symptoms building up. So it's a continuum of activation. So on the lower end of the continuum, let's say it's a one to 10, on the lower end of the continuum, you might feel a little bit of tingling. You might have a little bit of worry. You might feel some uncomfortable sensory symptoms, but that's still manageable. So that would be right down here. So I teach my clients how to actually check in and say, oh, this is how activated I am. And then you might experience, maybe we go to hypo down here, you might experience more extreme symptoms. So limp weakness, or difficulty walking might be more of a six or seven. So again, what I look at is it's a continuum and the symptoms build up. And I work on the lower end of the continuum in the beginning so that you can learn how to be with, how to actually explore those symptoms. And I will talk more about that. And um, you will become more and more comfortable our tendency is with anything that's out of control, you know, when I feel out of control in my body or emotionally or in my thinking, we want to get away from it. So a big part of the work I do is to say, let's explore, let's become um, curious about what's going on. And again, I know this is a lot of information, so um, I'm happy to answer any of the questions that you might have. So, my treatment goal when I work with people is to um, be able to access that area in the window of tolerance where you feel calm, where you don't have any symptoms, where your thoughts are not all over the place. Um, my thoughts are sometimes all over the place. Um, and to access that place 
where your nervous system can be regulated. And then over time, I teach my clients how to widen it so that the space within your comfort zone actually um, widens. And so the main goal is to self-regulate your nervous system. Um, so I talked about the one to 10 scale earlier. And this is my next slide here. And I talk about, you know, um, a little bit more about the activation curve. And um, I wrote it down so that you will have it in the presentation. And most of it I actually talked about. So the one thing I do when I work with young adults and youth, I love to bring parents in. I love to bring people in who care for that person because I think what I do, I can teach that to the parents and then you can help your children to regulate their nervous system. So um, we can do that in many different ways. I know that some of you who have been a, a main caretaker for your children, you regulated your child's nervous system early on. So that has to do with early attachment. So we talk about attachment and you can actually mirror your state of the nervous system to your child. Um, so that, that's a big part of the work. So we can teach our children to regulate their nervous system by modeling, by talking about our own nervous system, by helping them um, actually get more in tune with their own nervous system. I want to, um, you know, I'm not quite sure how much time I have, but I would like to talk a little bit more about the different phases of treatment. And earlier I said, um, treatment is very personalized, which is true. And I have a bigger framework within which I work. So I hold that in mind. And yet everybody is so different that I, um, take that in consideration. But there are three phases to the treatment that I offer. And actually the, the three phases are based on um, Pierre Janet's work. He actually was a colleague of Charcot, who was the founder of neurology. And um, uh, those two talked about uh, dissociation and trauma. So I am looking right now at, uh, at this. Okay, I just, got, <laughs> I just got a note from Bridget saying that I have a little bit more time. Thank you so much. Um, so phase one is um, really where all I do, well, it's not all I do, but all I do is to talk about things that stabilize, to introduce resources, and the, the goal of phase one is to reduce symptoms. And uh, it's very, very important to me to not jump right in to what everybody comes for, right? Everybody says, I don't want to have any symptoms anymore. So in phase one, um, the most important piece of what I do for myself is I have a beginner's mind. I listen. I listen to um, whoever comes into my office. I listen to their words. I listen to their body. I um, assume nothing. And I actually don't even read any of the reports that are being sent to me beforehand because I would like to get to know the person I would like to get to know who they are without FND. And I know that FND is a big part, but I'm really interested in who is this person. I think that has a lot to do with relation building and um, how to be present with somebody in the room that you actually don't know. 
So I know that many of you have had experiences where you felt dismissed, where you felt not listened to, where you felt like you were uh, crazy or somebody actually told you that you were making this up. And I think the first part in any work with FND, in my opinion, is to listen to the person in front of you. And once I have done that initially, then I can give information. Then I can talk about anything that has to do with psychoeducation. So I can talk about the window of tolerance, you know, talk about the hyperactivation and hypo, too much and not enough. I can talk about activation curve so that you really learn how to um, detect where your symptoms are. Um, I can educate you on sensory sensitivity and how that's actually related to a mechanism in the brain that's called the gating mechanism. So at that point, I can bombard everybody with information, but I think the first step is really to build a relationship. Oops. Here we go. My screen just didn't want to move. Um, so during phase one, which is still the first, you know, session, couples of sessions, I teach two basic concepts. And one is mindfulness. And most of you probably have heard of that, what that means, being mindful with our experience and to be able to uh, describe our experience in a way that I, I can say, oh, I have pain in my body, which is different than saying, I become that pain. So what you do is you become a mindful observer to your own experience. And in my experience working with FND, that's really, really important because the symptoms are overtaking us. The symptoms are overwhelming us. So learning how to become a witness to that experience really is a great tool. And not just for FND. Uh, I have practiced mindfulness for 25 years, and I think it's one of the greatest resources in my life. The other thing I teach is what's called tracking. And tracking is just what it sounds like. Tracking is the ability to connect with your body sensations. So anything you feel in your body, you can do that right now. So if you track your sensations right now, you can see that maybe the pain you have had five minutes ago actually shifted. Or maybe the twitches that they were there this morning, they have a different quality. So you learn how to track what's going on in your body. And one of the parts that I think is really, really scary in FND are all the involuntary movements, right? We are being taught, especially in the society, to be in control. And when we have symptoms where we are not in control, where our body is doing something that feels scary to us, and that also scares other people, that is unbelievably hard and we want to get away from it. I mean, that's very normal and natural. So any involuntary movements in your body is something that we are not taught to be with, to actually befriend or to study. So that's a big piece to look at what are involuntary movements and what are voluntary movements. Um, let me just see if I can move this a little bit along. So the, the goal of, oops, ah, the goal of self-regulation, the goal of the treatment is self-regulation of the nervous system um, so that you can learn when you're more overactivated, how do I regulate my nervous system on all levels, body, mind, and emotions so that my system can calm down.
phase two, and I'm gonna wrap this up a little bit. Phase two is actually where I start working with the symptoms. So phase one is about creating a good foundation. So you learn the skills to be a witness to your body. You learn the skills to track, to understand the different concepts of what's happening in the nervous system. And then I start working with the actual symptoms. And that can be really challenging. And in my experience, it's something that is also really rewarding. So instead of saying, I want to get rid of my symptoms, I work with them in a way that you learn how to be with, you learn how to, in the moment, regulate your system, and uh, then you can actually be with whatever's happening in your body more easily, which helps the nervous system to calm down. When you remember the window of tolerance that I talked about earlier, the window of tolerance, you know, where you have a middle, where you feel comfortable, you feel safe, you don't have a lot of symptoms. I use that concept again to work on the edges. So I never dive right into the most severe symptoms, but I work with you on maybe how to regulate your anxiety, how to work with your anxiety. And, um, and then we can build up. So the window of tolerance, the space where you feel safe and comfortable and symptom-free will increase over time. That's a big part of the, the work I do so that you learn how to do that yourself. Let's go actually to phase three, which in my experience, most people forget in this work. So if you are in my office and you're symptom-free, you will say, oh, I'm going home, I want, to, <laughs> I want to live my life, this is wonderful. And um, nobody really thinks about what happens afterwards. So what is a life without symptoms? How do I create positive relationships again with others and with myself and with this body that doesn't have symptoms anymore? And how can I make sense of this new reality that is not just about the symptoms that I have. So I think that's a really important part of the work to integrate that, to find pleasure again, to trust my body again, to say, yes, I can actually dream. I can make plans about going back to school or going back to university, whatever you might have dreamed about. And another part of that means we have to look at the beliefs that you have created over time. And the beliefs that a lot of you have created is, um, you know, I'm limited in my way of being. I'm limited in who I am as a person. And I'm limited in what I can do with my life. But I think it's so important to talk about that part and to say, who are you without your FND? So that you can get some guidance moving forward. That's a huge part to really look at that. I wanna actually share with you a little bit more about what I have learned, what the young adults and the teens I've seen in my office have taught me. And there are certain themes that keep coming up and that they have shared with me. And I would like to share some of those with you. Um, I think one of the big ones is listen. They say, listen, <laughs> listen, listen to me. And um, so really, truly listen and learn their language and speak their language. So there is no difference between the person who's sitting in my office and who I am. There is no difference because we're both human beings and we're both trying to live our life. Be honest, be yourself. I, a lot of my sessions are happening on the floor or we go outside or I take my shoes off 
Um, so be an equal with the person. That's a huge part. And let's let go of the hierarchy because there is really no hierarchy. I said that in the beginning. The reason I know everything I know about FND is because of everybody I have seen. So I know that this has been a lot of information. We talked about the window of tolerance, the activation curve, how to self-regulate, the way I look at FND, um, many, many concepts, mindfulness, and um, we talked about tracking. So all these different concepts, if there are any questions, please ask me. I'm happy to dive deeper and to answer any questions you have. We do have a few questions for you. Uh, we'll try to go through them as quickly as possible. We're, we are running out of time, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, thank you for all of that. We sure appreciate it. Uh, one of the couple, couple questions we keep hearing is age. You do actually treat all ages from, mm -hmm. I think you said 12 to 75 even. Yep, Perhaps. I had somebody walk into my office and she's 74. So yeah, now 75. One Wonderful, wonderful. Do you find that that treatment for teens and adults, do you, is there a lot of differences between how you approach? The, I think, what would be the main difference? I think what's different really is that the teens and the young adults, they really pick up if you don't show up as a person. And if you don't show up as who you are, um, that decreases the chances for a positive outcome. That's what I believe. Very true, very true. Um, another question that has come in is um, asking about when you were talking about the resources were lacking. What type of resources do you mean? So I talk about internal resources and external resources. And internal resources could be more something like I can check in with my breath and I can track my breath and that helps me to calm down. External resources more something like Maybe I can take a bath or somebody can hold me. So those are the kinds of resources I'm talking about. And I love bringing the family in because the family system, parents or whoever the caretaker is, they're really important to work with as well as a resource. Great, thank you. And let's see, we have one, we'll just take one quick last question okay. is, can you fluctuate between hyper and hypo at any time of the curve or only at the beginning? Great question. <laughs> That's a wonderful question. So in my experience, it happens at any point. You know, that it can be when you're highly activated, but it can also be when you just feel a little bit out of sync. So the fluctuate, fluctuation can happen at any point in my experience. Great, fantastic. Well, thank you so much for being here with us. There are a few other comments, a lot of people just positive feedback and you actually will be able to see that still. So okay. please, you know, view those and you can even type back some answers to some people. I'm happy to do that. Yes. To do that. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate Thanks for having it. me. Thank you very much. We really appreciate okay. you spending the time with us today. Yeah. Thank you.